Thank you so much for tuning in to the Love Good Podcast. We're sitting down today with Sandra McCracken. She's a beloved singer-songwriter here in Nashville, someone that really went next level in this conversation, talking about mountaintops and, and the beauty that can be found there, but also the, the valleys, or what she calls the shadow places, where so much of truth and so much of life is really lived. So uh, check it out. Really hope you enjoy the show. Well, Sandra, welcome to the Love Good Podcast. It's a great privilege to have you. Thanks. Good to be here. So uh, obviously, we both live in this great town in Nashville, Tennessee. We're actually at the moment in my little home here in Southeast Nashville. Um, but we've been in this town, both of us, for quite some time. It was college that brought us here. But even for you, um, what do you love about Nashville? It's changed so much mm-hmm. in the last 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. You've seen a lot of that change. You're, you're a Midwest girl coming from St. Louis, right? <laughs> yes. Which is a great city. I was just with about a thousand young people from St. Louis, 5,000 total from all over the Midwest, but St. Louis dominated yeah. this conference I was just at. Oh, they wow. just showed up in great numbers, you know. It was in St. Louis? It was, was in it? Springfield, so oh, not yeah. too far. Yeah. But St. Louis just seems to always take over at these things, you know, which is good. Yeah. Uh, but for you, what's, it, what's that transition, you know, now that you've been here for so long, initially, do you remember what it was like to first come to the South, to first come mm-hmm. to a city like Nashville? What was that like? Yeah, I remember, um, well, I have seen a tremendous amount of change in mm-hmm. the time I've been here. And I, I remember moving here um, in, in, I came here to go to Belmont, moved here in the mid nineties. And it was um, my first time in the South. And so the experience of people holding doors yeah. and courtesy and the, the deep Southern accents, which you still hear, but it was probably more prevalent in the city at the time. And a lot more kind of um, mom and pop restaurants mm. that were just like, you know, you get a burger or a, you know, just known for these little spots. And that was uh, a new experience. Like, Mm. I think it was completely um, startling to experience that kind of slowness and um, uh, hospitality. People in St. Louis were warm, um, but pretty efficient, you know? Like, (laughs) people have a place to go. They know exactly what they're doing. So I think Nashville has... The speed has has increased since I've been here. Just mm. the pace of life is a lot faster, and that's probably true everywhere. But I've seen it in this like little town becoming like a big little town, you mm. know. And and I remember that like the cultural climate and the faith climate was different. So in St. Louis, I had maybe two um, largely. I mean, for the last two years, I went to a Christian school during my upbringing. But for the majority of the time before that, I was in public school, and mm. I had like one or two friends that that would profess faith and, wow. and well, a lot of people with faith, um, actually were, there were a lot of kids that were, um, from a Jewish background and just really a, a mix when mm. I grew up. So coming here and it was like the norm yeah. that everybody would go to church yeah. to, a, you know, an evangelical church largely, or the big churches on every corner yeah. and a couple of large, like Episcopal churches that were just thri- have been thriving. And that felt different, like the Bible belt. Um, and at the same time, we had these groups. So at the West, Wes and Fran King, when I first moved here, they opened their home to discussion mm. nights. And there were a bunch of college kids. We'd pile in their living room, and everybody would ask questions, and anything was on the table. So theology, people working out their theology, people working out faith and music and life and every, you know, just everything imaginable in this living room setting. And that was formative for me as well and just to get to know them and they didn't have kids at the time but um but just like yeah just the welcome of community and the welcome of conversation and the ability to ask questions I think is still a feature of Mm. my life in Nashville I feel like people around me are just so um open to that and I love that that's it's been a really um, shaping thing. It's huge. I mean, to have that sense of community, as you put it, a slower pace and a real culture of hospitality, it's definitely not the norm. Uh, I'm curious. I mean, everybody I've ever talked to who's from St. Louis, when mm-hmm. you ask what school did you go to, they don't talk about college. It's always their high school. Is that mm-hmm. your experience? Like people are obsessed with their high school. high school. Yeah, in St. Louis. <laughs> That's the is question. that unique to St. Louis? I've never, is, yeah, okay. no. <laughs> That's St. Louis. Because it is a thing. It is, if you're from St. Louis, where yeah. you go to high school. So. Yeah, it's classic, yeah. classic. Yeah. Well, Nashville really is a special place. And I, you know, having gone to Vanderbilt, just down the road from Belmont, I was a bit of a Belmont wannabe the entire time I was there. I was showing up at this 
a really amazing night called Refuge over there at a church not too far off campus from Belmont. Yeah. And that was a big part of my experience when I was in college. And, and I was really struck just by the, the culture of faith in this town. Mm -hmm. It's not the norm. It's just, I, I think there's more steeples per square mile in Nashville than just about any other city, maybe apart from Rome, Italy, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's really remarkable and really unique. Obviously, the faith has been a huge part of your life and, and even your artistry. Um, obviously, being uh, so involved in Cayman's Call for a long time, you know, that was, you know, a massive imprint, you know, mm -hmm. on a lot of people's hearts and minds and imaginations, that band and the music that came out of that, that season of your life. And then you've really ventured into such a beautiful solo career. And I'm particularly eager to, to chat about the, the new album. But, you know, the last few years of really being, uh, I'm sure, much more focused. I mean, how long have you been putting out solo records? About 15 years, yeah, is that right? The first one was um, was called The Crucible, came out in 99. It's awesome. <clears throat> so it's been a minute. Yeah. Um, I was 12. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so it is, it is funny. And I've always been um, interested in independent music. I think yeah. that was one of the things I noticed about Nashville was when I was in St. Louis, I was pretty enamored with, uh, you know, what was happening, what was coming out of Christian music at the time, which was like, yeah, I mean, it was a broad, it was like a, there was a wide spectrum of totally. topics. And so it was like great music, you know? Yeah. Um, but then when I got to Nashville, I realized, oh, they like, they want to put me in a box That's to right. do Christian music. That's and right. so I was like, no, no thanks. Yeah. So I felt like very resistant. So the trajectory for me probably changed when I moved to Nashville and I was like, I'm going to stay out of those associations in a marketing world totally. from a marketing standpoint and then just continue to try to live into the the more um the smaller questions like mm. i don't know what do you want to do for this gig for this night and then trying to live out of a place that was like it could be either i love we, that we don't know who the audience will be we don't mm. know if they're people of faith or if they're not and it's all fair game so yeah. trying to yeah stay out of the boxes as much as possible has been um maybe a hallmark of of my uh, practice over the years. Yeah, well, it's, it's a hallmark of a lot of really authentic artists, you know? Like, none of us really want to be put in a box. And, you know, if you are to embrace a, a label or a publishing deal yeah. or step into an industry, you're going to have to make some compromises along the way. Sure. Because suddenly you have a team a around you. That's right. Because right. you That's also, right. there's something, obviously there's something that you gain that I did not gain mm. in terms of success or just having that megaphone to get mm. out to a bigger audience or... But that trade-off for me has been really, like, I don't have any regrets around yeah. that. No, that's yeah. awesome. And one of the things that really strikes me listening to your music is there's such a heartfelt poetry and peace in the way that you, you deliver your creativity, the way that you deliver that gift. Uh, I don't know how that could come except out of freedom, mm -hmm. stillness, as we said earlier, kind of a, a slower pace of life, because I think we're really terrified of slowing down, just like we're Maybe. terrified of yeah. silence in today's world. Yeah. As soon as you're silent, you have to deal with things, and you have to deal with yourself, you know? Yeah. I'm curious, in your creative process, especially in the writing of songs, what what is the initial inspiration, or how do you kind of posture yourself or prepare yourself for those moments when the creativity really strikes? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think stillness and silence as a practice was not my natural upbringing was not my default because right. I'm the youngest of five kids. Wow. And our house was always chaotic. That's and so my cool. dad was a teacher and a coach there and cousins and students and his runners. He was a cross country coach. And I mean, it was just like a, I loved it. It was like a circus, but I wonder what was formed in me or if I had a natural inclination toward more of a contemplative life, mm -hmm. but it was dormant until I was like in my thirties, you yeah. know, I wonder if in the last, you know, in the last 10 years, that's really been like a homecoming mm -hmm. or if it was something that was, that I was fighting for because I didn't have enough of it. Right. And, and it is scary to get quiet. And yet when it's, um, it's once you taste it, mm -hmm. then it's, it's also kind of has its own quality of like regenerative. It's got a regenerative, regenerative quality That's right. that you keep coming back to. Like, mm. okay, I can tell what noise feels like when it's in my spirit, yeah. you know, yeah. I can tell when it's out there, but I can tell when it's in here. Yeah. And being able to identify that then has allowed me to start, um, making different habits, trying to form different habits. And 
I say all that, and it's been such a crazy yeah. season. But I know that that's um, a real anchor for me, and yeah. that it's um, important to keep fighting for it. It's amazing. And whether you're an artist or not, it's like all of us need that stillness yeah. and that silence or that anchoring. Yeah. So I'm just coming off of several weeks on the road, which is sort of typical right now. But I yeah. was this morning just like ironing clothes, you know, mm-hmm. like just feeling normal for about an hour doing laundry. Mm-hmm. And I had a friend I was chatting with around the same time, and she said, you know, those things are actually really important because they anchor you. They, they just kind of help you feel yeah. like there's a sense of rootedness and a sense of stability. But I dare yeah. say, like, more than laundry, silence, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, allowing yourself to really just be still is huge mm-hmm. wherever you find yourself. I want to read a quote from your website because it's, oh, it's no. unbelievable and uh, something that could actually spark a three-hour conversation. So we'll somehow okay. have to just, like, retain or, you know, <laughs> refrain from all the inspiration that's going to come here. But um, in the first paragraph, as you're kind of introducing this new album that you've put out, it says this, that beauty is found on the mountain peaks, but it's also found in the shadow places, in the secret darkness of a mother's womb, and in the valley. Truth comes in unexpected moments, surprising us with illumination. The songs on this album are from the valley, but they're pierced through with light. Uh, Wow. Uh, I think there's a lot of us who can resonate with darkness and valley, and uh, just the reality that actually... You know, to, to be a person of faith or to be a, a person who's really engaged in their own human experience means like a willingness to not just hang tight and pitch our tents on the mountains, which mm-hmm. is where most of us want to be all the time, mm-hmm. um, but to actually realize that sometimes the, the greatest growth and, and the deepest truths come out of the valley, mm-hmm. come out of the in-between moments and uh, the realities of of struggle and, and suffering that most of us don't like to talk about. Mm. And I'm not forcing you to talk about it, but <laughs> I'm curious, what, what inspired uh, the album, like the title, and then this just this mm. imagery of the mountains and the valleys mm. in between? Um, thanks for asking about all that. It's, um, there's a lot in there. So as I reflect on both that as a thesis or as kind of an overarching statement about the record, um, and I look back at... Um, songs from the valley like how it came into being really that album was um was born out of the same season as the psalms so the songs were written right next to each other they were all written during the same months and um some within a few days of each other like i i wrote um from the psalms album if you're familiar with it it's there's a song called my soul finds rest Mm -hmm. and within a day or two um not more than a week apart, I wrote "Letting Go" from the new from "Songs from the Valley." Yeah. But when all that was coming into view, and I was trying to figure out, well, what's which? How how do you actually put these together as an album, and which songs belong together? It seemed like there were two things emerging. One was an album of psalms, like direct, um, prayerful scripture, uh, just in my own voice. Like mm. just read the psalms, just sing the psalms, however they come up out of the page. And that came out at, right alongside of these narrative songs that felt, I don't know that they felt darker because I think there's light in both, mm. but I do think that they were more, a little bit more personal to my own story. So they yeah. weren't David's words, they were my words. Yeah. So the, you know, like, so in that song, there's the line about like taking a, a spotlight in the basement. It's like the illumination was, um, some of it happens to us, and some of us, we, we have to actually be willing to f- flip the light on and go down there and mm. go down the stairs and see how, how much of a disaster that area <laughs> might be, right? <laughs> like, um, we were looking at houses today, my daughter, who's nine, we, we, were ta- we saw one basement, and we were like, oh, yeah, this basement's not scary like ours. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Like, but these, these ways that when you walk around in a house... Um, if you walk around in a house you, you haven't lived in, you see things that the person living there doesn't see, right? right? Just because you're so acclimated to your own surroundings that, that blind spots or um, imperfections mm. or um, all of that, it just kind of goes unnoticed f- right. for us. And I think that's the nature of, of walking in faith as well, is that God is committed to illumination, the illumination of our hearts. And so mm. the circumstances swirling around are sort of irrelevant to what that what he's trying to like they're not irrelevant they're not meaningless but they are 
they're fleeting, they're secondary to um, what he is imparting and embodying in us. So Mm -hmm. the light, the truth, the confession, the um, renewal that comes out of those shadow places is something that cannot be taken from us. And it's something that actually has eternal value. Mm -hmm. So we might not remember... Uh, like when when I talk about that song, We Will Feast in the House of Zion, like we won't remember the tears. We won't remember the specific sensation of those, like, you know, of a bee sting or mm. of, um, of a loss the same way, you know, that we did in the moment. And yet there's something that we receive from that experience because of the gospel of Jesus that like stays with us mm. and that becomes part of who we are that will never be... Um, threatened or removed. So there's, I think this album of songs, um, it's really, I think it was somewhat of just a, um, putting them in little, we talked about putting things in boxes. There's something helpful about put, like if you have a a garden plot and you're like, okay, the marigolds and the sunflowers, (laughs) they'll go over here. The tomatoes, they're going to drop seeds. They need to go over here. So it was really just sort of like that. And Mm. Um, I chose to put the Psalms first because I wanted to plant a flag that was declarative mm. for my own personal expression after a hard season. Yeah. It was like, okay, well, this is my first plant. Yeah. And then the other one can come later when it's not so emotionally charged, when right. I can sing these without breaking down. Yeah. And I really can't. Like, there's a level of detachment to the... I'm not detached from the songs but growth, because I'm such an emotional person, growth for me is moving toward like healthy, mm. healthy, like even yeah. detachment so that I don't have to like mm. cry about everything that, that I feel for everybody else yeah. all day, day long. Yeah. And I think it's not the same for everybody. I think some people have, um, they're a little more naturally stoic and they need right. people to help. Like we need community. We need people around us to help us to feel the peaks and valleys. Um, feeling the peaks and valleys is not a stride. That is not a hard thing for me to access. Mm. So for me, growth is toward um, like a steady walk, you know, like mm. God's highway, like this. That image for me is like keep walking on a straight path and um, and don't make more drama for yourself than you need, you mm. know? <laughs> like, I love that. So it is, um, it has really changed over the years. And I think even in those, putting the songs from the valley, releasing that, three years after the songs were written largely, um, was intentional. And Mm. it was like, and it feels like that was a healthier choice for me than coming out of the gate with those songs. It's really beautiful. Long answer, but. It's really good. I mean, even thinking about the gift that you bring to the world as an artist, but I think also as a woman, there's a feminine genius. You know, I, I don't think men have the easiest time feeling everything or being comfortable with feeling everything. Like I actually, a lot of times, just try to get out of a feeling as soon as it comes on as quickly right. as possible. So I shelve it, or mm-hmm. I compartmentalize it, or I distract myself, or I, I just sort of do something else mm-hmm. that doesn't make me sit in the pain or sit in the whatever it might be. I mean, sometimes I'm even just afraid of like too much thrill mm-hmm. or too much uh, inspiration because like actually at times that sort of led me astray. If I get too on board with something, I don't really mm-hmm. consider the options or the alternatives. And so all that to say, I think that actually this is so much of what you do with your music is you allow the rest of us to even put language around things that perhaps we're experiencing and feeling but don't know how to mm-hmm. put a, a in, into a words or we don't have a vocabulary for it. We mm-hmm. can't express it. Like it's it's a massive gift right. that you bring. Oh, and man, thank you. I, I mean, I think that the... The, the primary thing is not to make the emotions bigger. Right. I think it's to figure out what are the, what are the real substantive um, emotions beneath all the surface emotions. I so I can get all stirred up about a bunch of stuff that means nothing. Mm. And then I will not, it will not matter in two weeks. But beneath those like big, you know, waves that are created on the surface, there's like this steady undercurrent. And I think the Psalms help us to access the undercurrent of, of real substantive emotion Mm. that is then, you know, can be transferred and and transmitted through prayer. Mm. Like as we talk to God about not just all the surface stuff, but like, like the, I lost my keys, which we should talk about that. You know, like I lost my (laughs) keys. I'm frustrated. I'm angry with myself. I'm late to a meeting, but then beneath that, it's like, um, it's the question of like, 
am I taken care of? Am mm. I loved? Mm. Can I get what my needs met? Like these primary questions that are beneath the other ones. And I think the, the way that the psalmists talk about those it gives us permission to say, yeah, there's real stuff in there, but being able to differentiate between the surface and the substance is maybe the hard work. I love that. And, and these are really almost primordial questions, you know, on every human heart. You know, do I, do I have what it takes? Yeah. Is there actually going to be like provision in yeah. my life? And, um, you know, will the mess or the disaster of things actually ever turn into something beautiful, you right. know? So it's really cool that, <laughs> right. again, through the art, through the music, uh, you, you, actually help us ask all the right questions. And as you said, we don't, we don't then settle for these kind of ephemeral wants or these mm. surface level realities that are always rooted in something deeper. So here's my question just for you personally. How do you, how do you live in this paradox? It seems like a contradiction, but it's really just a beautiful paradox that actually we need to feel things deeply and experience life to the full and yet also allow for a really disinterested love and what i mean by that is just selfless love or as you put it detachment really mm -hmm. come alongside that H how do you live in that paradox or that that tension yourself hmm. um it's messy yeah yeah and i and i think um <clears throat> some days i'm more aware than others of what's going on within me and um i think being in whatever family configuration or, or roommate configuration, I think the people that you live closest to are the people that expose those shadows and the, that light more than any, any place else. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of extends from there, you know, the coworkers where you're in the trenches doing the day to day slog, you know, with whatever the work is. Um, those are the places where it's revealed if we're paying attention. Like, um, I think being the youngest child, my default is like, oh, you know, just kind of being the princess and I did everything <laughs> right and I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And then what the real truth is, like as I walk out, walk in life with my husband, it's like, oh man, that's really ugly. Like mm. what's going on here? Mm. And having, so living it out maybe looks like um, taking some time reflecting on some little small conflict over breakfast that happened and by midday addressing it as soon as possible yeah. and saying like, Hey, I did this thing. And how did this feel for you? Mm. Like that probably didn't feel great, mm. you know? And I'm, and I'm not the princess that didn't intend anything wrong. I actually am like self-serving and I'm looking to my own means yeah. to take care of myself. So I want to quit doing it and I can't. So yeah. like being, trying to live out of this confessional, um, mutual, uh, self-awareness is, uh, I don't know. I mean, and that sounds like a ton of work. It's actually, it's actually not. It's even in the middle of a crazy schedule. I think that stuff is happening all the time if we're paying attention to it. I love it. And there's a humility there. I mean, that's an embrace of the reality of things, you know, yeah. to, to think that we've somehow got it all figured out or that actually we're incapable of hurting other people. That's right. the lie. Like it's always somebody else. That that's right. May have misinterpreted that's right. my good intentions. It's that's like, right. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Except there's like no freedom in joining that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right, because yeah. you're actually just managing all the surface stuff. That's right. And it's control, and mm. it's actually not belonging and love and connection that's yeah. waiting for us beneath all that I love it. charade on the top. And this is it. This is what every human heart longs for, yeah. you know, connection, a sense of belonging, and, and actually like the need that we all have for mercy, yeah. you know, because yeah, we just can't do this thing called life alone. We can't do it well anyways. And the good thing about mercy is that it doesn't require anything from the other person. That's like, right. It can happen within us by the Holy Spirit. Like if mm. we are, if we receive the mercy of God, we can offer the mercy of God. It doesn't make any difference what they do with it. Mm. So that's where then the detachment is like saying, okay, that's up to you, you know? But as like just trying to live in that confessional way of vulnerability, I think brings a safety among relationships that's like, can be really dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And actually it, it begets transparency and vulnerability. Yeah. Like the more usually. people, ex yeah, usually, I guess not always, huh? <laughs> some people, some people do kind of prey on it, honestly. When uh, you have somebody that's really confessional and like leads with vulnerability, Yeah. when that becomes the norm, there also needs to be a, like, like if you're in a church context mm. around that and you have people that nurture a safe environment for vulnerability, you also are going to need like shepherds around that's the right. edge of that saying, 
hey, you don't mess with this, you know, yeah. and to be vigilant about how to protect the space mm. for vulnerability because I think mm. it can be exploited. Yeah, and that happens within a church, within a family, within yeah. any community where people gather. Having a culture yeah, of transparency and Anywhere vulnerability. There are humans. That's right. <laughs> there it is it a demands risk protection. And exploitation. And I love that. Yeah. Ooh, this is good. So, Sandra, I feel like we could go on for three hours, and uh, maybe one day we will. But it'd be really nice to just uh, hear a, a little bit more about the album, where people can find it, how they can be supporting you, even just to know your website, your social media. What's the best way for people to keep tracking Sandra McCracken and future projects? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, well, the website is sandramccracken.com, and um, I believe that right there on the front page of that, you can you can click right through to find out more about Songs from the Valley. That one is available just vinyl only and digital, so, cool. so we're not making the little plastic discs for that anymore. What are those called? I don't Com know if any... CDs, <laughs> compact discs. I don't think kids even know what those are anymore, you know? Yeah. Speaking of cleaning out the basement, I was like, I have so many CDs. <laughs> But you know, they don't, um, if they're all sealed, so you, they're still good. So funny. They don't really expire. It, well, they make a, a comeback in 20 years, thing. though. Should we, we all hang on to hang our, on to you know? Until that's cool again. It, yeah. Um, but so the new record is available vinyl and digital only. And uh, I think it's on Spotify as well. So streaming, I mean, I'm all for it. I'm all for like discovery and streaming and, uh, and then paying it. I think it all it all works out, you know, mm. like I, I want people to experience and have access to the music and however that works, it, you know, it used to be like the best way to discover an artist or discover new music was somebody to make you a mixtape. Mm. And I think there are new ways that that can look, but to remember that it's not like as the music industry changes to remember that it's not about like making money on every single sale. It's about, um, that chain reaction between right. people that are affected by something beautiful. Mm. And if that's happening, you know, ain't nothing you're going to do to like that's break right. down that structure, you that's know, right. it's going to be there. So anyway, and then there'll be, I think there's an email list on the website as well. And I post on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, which is all just my name as, as a handle. So it's awesome. Anyway, that's all the that's the commercial portion. Well, Sandra, you've totally uh, <laughs> floored me, and I know all of our listeners today with this conversation. Thanks. So thank you for your, your humility, your honesty, your genuineness, and, and really your desire uh, to live life in such a way that um, you know other people are able to be more human when they come into contact with you and, mm -hmm. and again, your artistry. So uh, until thank next you. time, it's been a total privilege. Thank you, too. thank you so much. Really hope you enjoyed the show today with Sandra McCracken. I found myself really, really inspired by the end of that conversation. There's so many more conversations like this that were happening constantly on our YouTube channel. If you haven't yet subscribed, do so now. There's also so many other videos that you can explore as well. So it means a lot that you believe in beauty and culture and what love good is all about. We'll see you next time.